so we have started this open access conference with a presentation of the European Research Council and we will close with another major funding institution especially for scientific research in Switzerland, the Swiss National Science Foundation. In 2007, the Swiss National Science Foundation has made public its recommendation in favor of open access, requiring that the results of the research activities funded by the SNSF are deposited in an open archive using the Green Road. The SNSF now also supports the gold path to open access. As of 1st October 2013, researchers receiving SNSF funding can cover the costs of publishing articles in pure open access journals via the project budget. What is the SNSF's global strategy for the dissemination of research results? What about the research data we have been briefly approached before? Could we be provided with some elements of comparison regarding the research funding policies in other countries? I will now give the microphone to Dr. Daniel Hirschli, Director of the Administrative Offices at the SNF, who, was honored, who has honored us with, the presence, with his presence today. Excuse me. So, dear colleagues, um, first I would like to thank uh, the organizers very much to invite, for inviting me here to speak on a very important topic, uh, open access. Um, it's an honor for me to be here at EFBFL. Many of you know that our president of the Research Council of the Swiss National Science Foundation is Martin Vetterli, professor here at EPFL. So I was very impressed to see the list of the speakers, very competent speakers. I am not competent. I'm not an expert in open access. I have to admit it at the beginning already. Um, so I'm warning you, if you uh, please do not attend now a highlight at the end of this program. I'm probably the last speaker because I could not come earlier. And I could not attend uh, uh, without the last speech. I could not attend all the presentations. So I feel a little bit that maybe I, uh, I run the risk to, of, of repetitions. I apologize also for this. In the best case, maybe I, I uh, say the opposite, you say it, so that we have enough stuff for a discussion at the end. So I do not uh, present the Swiss National Science Foundation. Uh, most of you know our organization for people from abroad. We are a pure funding agency, as you know it in, in many other countries. What I would look, uh, would present, would like to present is uh, first how a research funding organization is looking at and perceiving the current developments in open access. Second, what do we do here and now in order to foster open access at the Swiss National Science Foundation and a very short outlook, where do we see challenges in the future? Towards a new publication system, my research topic was uh, history of political thought. So a wall of books for me is a very nice picture. I like it very much. But of course, time are changing and the funding agency has also to adapt its policy to changes in, in the publication system. Let's look first at the traditional publication system. Uh, more or less 80% of the journals are still uh, subscription-based, so we are still a little bit in, in the world of, a, of an old publication system. In this brave old world, everything was simple. I think uh, very clear roles for researchers, for publishers, for libraries, and no role for funders, you could say, or at least almost no role uh, one thing we did and we are we still doing is funding uh, uh, monographs, books, uh, this kind of publications, but we have no relation with publications in journals. So, um, of course, you all know that this brave old 
system is not so brave, especially for libraries, I think. We all know uh, the problematic uh, trends with endlessly growing subscription fees. Uh, public, pu pu um, publishers making profits. And if you look carefully, they, may, they are making profits out of unpaid labor of authors, of editors, of referees. So researchers are working, and I say it in a short, provocative way, publishers are making profits. So um, in a recent article, Odlitzko uh, called this the Tom Sawyer economy. You remember Tom Sawyer, the boy who who was able to get paint the fence by other boys and was paid for this. So it's a little bit the same situation. I think it's, on one way, this uh, comparison is true, on the other way not. Tom Sawyer was paid by apples, by marbles, by dead frogs, etc. Uh, publishers today are really making huge profits. Uh, and this, in this way, the comparison is not uh, very exact. So, Orlitzko, in this recent article, he describes the situation, a competition between libraries and publishers on public funds. So there is a little uh, limited funds available for running the publication system, and there is a transfer of public funds from libraries to publishers. That's a, a trend. Uh, for example, with these uh, big deals of publishers with libraries, they have to, to buy a bulk of, of journals and on one side, uh, this has approved access to research results. That's uh, an advantage. But on the other side, in the long run, uh, probably this leading to an inefficient and, uh, uh, system and to profit maxim maximization on the sides of the publishers. So we are now in the situation, if you look at this traditional system, that uh, we need new business models, I think and the digitalization enables cost-saving publishing, and the question is how uh, the scientific community can use these opportunities. If you go on to the green road, <coughs> the first is the first option for open access, what has changed? Uh, of course, better access uh, to many publications, thanks to self-archiving, but not much in the roles, really, of the players in the publication system, not yet, at least, I think. We have still uh, publishers, researchers, libraries. Now we have between the repositories, uh, of course, and uh, the role of funders did not really change within the system. Many funders, they, they mandated researchers to use this opportunity of repositories uh, really to, um, to make open access uh, publications as soon as possible uh, on the green road. But uh, no fundamental change in the role of funders uh, in this model. How does the green road work in our view? Of course, it improved access to research results, but on the other way, we see some weakness. Researchers are reluctant to self-archive uh, their results. Uh, I got different uh, studies on this. They show different figures on the willingness of researchers to uh, use self-archiving, uh, but all show that there is room for improvement. Uh, high potential for improvement. Then we have, of course, in this system, constraints set by publishers, especially uh, long embargo periods. Uh, that's uh, an obstacle to an earlier access to publications. We have some uh, discussions on quality assurance and citing issues, because often you have uh, in your repositories you can find preprints, postprints publishes P P PDFs and, and so on, and, and it's not always sure which um, of these publications you cite, so a certain insecurity could arise in the system. It's rather the trend that the subscription fees persist on a high level, so no, uh, and, and on the other side, 
uh, for institutions, for libraries, they have to run uh, with additional cost repositories. Of course, there I have to re relativize uh, this last statement because repositories, they don't have only the aim of open access, they, ha they have other aims, visibility of institutions and so on, but there are additional costs in, in the system, in the green road. Let's go on to the gold road. There we have uh, sometimes major changes. We have often different financial models with an author paid instead of a reader paid model. So uh, researchers have to pay article processing charges, the A, uh, APCs, and there is a new challenge, of course, of funders. They fund researchers, and if researchers would like to publish their result in open access journals, ultra paid open access, open access journals. How can they uh, fund this publication? How can, uh, should funders uh, give money to the researchers to do this? We have other models of open access journals. Should funders subsidize uh, on another, another question is, should um, funders subsidize open access monographs? We are discussing this. And maybe no more print monographs. Uh, then we have often only 30% of open access journals, according to the directory of open access journals, use the author paid model. So uh, there are other mo models, for example, um, membership fees to journals for all affiliated researchers of an institution. Should funders uh, give money to institutions, block grants to institutions? Uh, there are many new questions with, the change in, with these changes in the system to the, to the gold road. So, also if you look at the gold road, there is not, I would like to say not all is, is uh, all are happy with this. We, we see also weaknesses in, on the, in this model. Researchers are all also reluctant to publish in open access journals. Then we have in this model still strategic attitudes of publishers to save profits, which can uh, create obstacles to open access in this way. For example, the double dipping in, with hybrid models. So, on one side, publishers, they have still subscription-based uh, journals, but they give the opportunity to researchers to pay for their specific uh, publication to get it open access immediately. And in this way, the publishers, they get twice uh, money for the publication. In my view, I say it openly, it's the worst case if you would like to change the system really to a real open access system. It's, it's the worst case because there you have profits on the side of the publishers and it's, of course, uh, no willingness to change this model if you have a good life. Another question is uh, APCs. If you have an auto paid model, can you reduce the overall cost for publications or do you replace subscription fees by expensive article processing charges? That's another uh, uh, challenge. And of course, the funder, if we pay APCs, then we have an interest that these APCs are not too, too high. Then we have, uh, of course, doubts about quality assurance, concerns that uh, paying to publish may inflate acceptance rates and lower quality standards. I don't know if you could follow this, this debate in, in, in the last, uh, it was a, a hot debate on the relation of open access and and peer review uh, in science and elsewhere uh, during the last weeks. I could not follow it in detail, but uh, there is a, a hot debate on, on this issue. And of course, peer review should not be questions uh, only because we want to change uh, uh, the system. So what can we do to improve the situation? Maybe to, to foster the transition of the system New cost-saving publishing models, I think that's very interesting. There are ideas uh, how you can change this. Uh, some call it not fee-based gold road or others call it diamond road. That doesn't matter, but uh, I think uh, new cost-saving models uh, are necessary. 
then I think we need still more awareness that open access is important for science and for society. Think, for example, only at researchers in uh, less developed countries. With real open access system, they have much better access to all uh, scientific information. And I think uh, it's quite clear rule, publicly, publicly funded research results must be publicly accessible. I think in, in the long run we should have this, uh, this formula, we, sh we, we must realize it. So I think scientists should really opt for open access, but on the other hand have freedom to choose green or gold road. But you should be aware at the moment when you, you, when you choose what you are really doing. Do you opt for uh, gold road for an open access journal? Or if not, then in, a, in another moment you should uh, um, use the option of self-archiving. I think that's from point of view, if I look at, at the science system, the science community must be maybe a little bit more aware and it's not in every scientific field, the aware awareness of course is at the same level. Maybe at EPFL you have uh, disciplines where it is higher than maybe in, in, in other disciplines. Then maybe we should analyze why researchers are reluctant to publish in open access. Are they questions related to impact factor, etc.? cetera? Uh, I mentioned the cost for open access in, a, in an auto paid model. I mentioned quality and rea reliability of open access journals. Then in some cases today, maybe you can have rem remuneration for books or educational material in an open access model. Maybe you, you, you will not have this. Should we look for remuneration also in an open access model? Different question. I think we should analyze this and look at in, an improved reputation of open access journals and for other measures. I do, go, do not go into the details Incentives for researchers to publish in open access, I doubt personally a little bit because from a point of view of a researcher, I think you should feel free to choose the best journal for your publication and not have incentives, too many incentives to go to choose the gold road or, or, or green road, but to, to, to choose the appropriate journal. That's your freedom you should have. We are in a transition process and the transition will not be easy because we have some identical but also many conflicting interests between publishers and the scientific community. Um, I do not go into the detail. Uh, I understand that the publishers are uh, resistant to a systematic change. They begin, of course, to, to think about the future. But uh, in my feeling not in a very, very progressive way. From the point of view of scientific community, as I mentioned, cost-saving publishing models uh, could be initiated by the community. And my personal view, the scientific community has no responsibility to save publisher. It's an open economic market. And there, the enterprises, they have to adapt to, to changing uh, framework condition to new challenges. Let's come to Swiss National Science Foundation. Shortly, what do we do as a funder now concretely? Uh, I, I mentioned that uh, in the old system, we had no real role in the publication system. Now, this has changed. Um, maybe a preliminary remark, Swiss National Foundation in contrast to other funding agency, for example, the DFG in Germany, we do not have a mandate to gain access to research results and publications for the whole scientific community. There are funding agencies, they really they have, they have to foster the overall access to the system. We do not have this mandate. In our view, this is rather, for example, the consortium of the university libraries, and they are working on this. Uh, and here we have, I think we have to separate the roles of 
in Switzerland of what's the role of the fan, of a founding agency, what's the role of the institutions together, uh, how can we uh, help to change the situation with our specific roles. So, um, I, I think I mentioned it, for Swiss National Science Foundation, we do not make real, uh, really a difference between green road and gold road. Both is possible, both should be possible um, for researcher. Uh, we are promoting open access in, in every way, you can say, uh, with some conditions, free choice of research, as I said. Quality assurance should ma be maintained. That's, I think it's very important. Peer review in the classical system, we have new ideas about peer review. That's not so much the question, but quality assurance is important in our view. And we, if we can, we also would like to help to create new cost-saving publication models. We promote op open access in our own sphere of competence, as I said. We, we don't would like to, to interfere in, in the fields of, of uh, universities, for example. On the other side, we are working together on the international, with international uh, partners and on the national level as well. We are if you look at the whole system, a small player, and without collaboration with other players, we cannot have really effects. Since 2008, we mandate the researcher we fund. They have to um, use the open access opportunities. Uh, we don't include their monographs yet, but for all journal articles, they have to opt for open access if possible on the green road, repository or web. And in our view, if possible, uh, with the post print uh, or the publisher's PFD, uh, a PDF uh, uh, version. If this is not possible, if you, have, if you choose a journal where there is an embargo, and a never ending embargo, for example, and you try it hard and you cannot find a way to public uh, in an open access repository, for example, uh, you fulfilled your obligation. So we do not urge you to, for example, to um, violate a contract with a publisher. And we are not a police uh, organization, so we do not really check every publication you made. We made a, a review a year ago, how good researchers do to respect and, and of course, we, we, we rather encouraging to use this than than uh, um, than have than to have sanctions when you you're not doing this. Now we, we invite you also, maybe a little more than before, to use uh, the gold road. And since the first of October, you heard it, we pay costs of public publications in poorly open access journal. So the rule is you have a grant from us and with the money of your grant you can pay open access uh, uh, charges and up to 3,000 Swiss francs per publication. Uh, there is a limit uh, on this and if you have at the end of, uh, of the grant, if you have money left, you can use it for example for this. We do not give more money only for open access, but often uh, researchers, they give money back or they can transfer it to the next grant. And we say you, it, the uh, open access charges are eligible costs, so you can use this money rather than giving, giving it back to, to us. Hybrid models are excluded. I mentioned this double dipping. We do not want to support this, uh, this double dipping. And so for hybrid models, uh, we do not, uh, you cannot, uh, um, these are not eligible costs. We set a limit for this new rule until the end of 2016. It's until the end of the four-year period um, of the Confederation. Uh, and we will uh, reconsider our policy for the next four-year period um, based on the experience we will make with this new policy. 
I saw that two days ago you had a, an internal release on this new policy. Thank you very much that you inform your researchers and I can only invite all the researchers to use this new opportunity. Maybe shortly, um, what are we doing on international level? We are working together uh, in the frame of, uh, framework of Science Europe. It's an organization with other funding agency on some research performing or, uh, organizations of, of Europe. Uh, we have their working group. They will meet next week in Paris. And then in the new um, Global Research Council, uh, where we have an annual meeting uh, last May in Berlin, open access for a major issue and will be also a major issue next year because it's really a challenge for the whole uh, global scientific system. And as a, I said, we are a, a very um, small player if you look at the whole world, of course. Finally, a very short outlook um, on the topic of open science because open access is a part, a small part of the develop, development towards open science. I show you here a quotation of uh, the Open Access Day of Hamburg uh, at the beginning of this month. Open access shouldn't be considered as an isolated topic, but as a, but as a part of an overall development towards open science. And just the contextualization of open access publications with research data, very important, and open educational material embedded in social networks breaks the ground. So that's the, the vision. You heard more, much more I saw in other uh, speeches about uh, open science. I do not continue here. Um, but I think the, the link with research data, open access to research data is of course very, very important. We have a rule in our uh, regulations that researchers should put, make available their research data. Um, maybe it's not very much known. And we would like next year, we have many projects, so, uh, but next year we would like to reconsider a little bit this policy on open access to research data, maybe um, make clear the rules, and there we have many different uh, challenges according to the different uh, scientific disciplines, of course. So that's uh, for us uh, one of uh, um, an important topics in the next years. Is open science at the end uh, a realistic vision for a new publication system? We, we do not know, at, la at least uh, I cannot say this, how fast and how realistic is it that uh, with open science we can really change the whole publication system. Uh, we can imagine different models with different roles for researchers and other players in a, in a quite different other system. What I only can say that at the Swiss National Science Foundation we would like to observe this situation and if there are new challenges uh, for researchers and we are funding researchers then we would like to adapt our policy to cope the new challenges and to be up to date with the developments in the publication system. I'm at the end. Here you have some uh, indications on our website where you can find more detailed information on our open access policy. You can also contact Fabian Jecker, who is in charge of the open access uh, uh, dossier. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for this final presentation. Um, are there questions for Dr. Hirschli? Thank you for your presentation. I have uh, a couple of questions, actually. Uh, first of all, i like to know, um, you still allow researchers to self-archive their publication to their own personal website in your open access policy. Why is that? Um, depends on the disciplines. Philosophers told us that for them, 
if they look uh, for new new developments in the discipline, they look for heads, they look for res at, at researchers, and then they go to, on the website, on the personal website. And for philosophers, it's very important to have all the publications on the personal website. And they say, for us, repositories are not so much uh, efficient. And so we have to, to respect the, all the different disciplines. Maybe some days we will change this and, and say only repositories, because also this disciplinary culture, of, co of course, they will change by the time. But at the moment, respecting all the different disciplines, we, this is still possible. Okay, thank you. And um, are you planning on a bigger budget to uh, provide more uh, financial uh, budget for uh, gold open access, for example? Because right now you can just uh, uh, use uh, the money you, you get uh, for the project to uh, finance uh, open access publications, but you don't get extra money, so to say. So will that change in the next couple of, of, of years? Um. We try to get more money for this. So we have, uh, every four years, we have to submit the multi-annual plan to the Confederation, and there we had uh, the topic of open access, and we, would, we wanted more money, really, to, to um, have higher grants and to include open access in this. We will try again, and we are thinking about uh, also changing a little bit the whole uh, project funding and to give maybe more freedom, more uh, global, uh, global budgets to researchers, and maybe rise some of these for the best researchers to rise the budget, so that you should have more freedom, not only for open access, but, only, uh, but also for other uh, activities related to your, your project. So are we thinking on different ways to give you more freedom and, if possible, also more money? What we did, didn't want it to do is to have a special pot for open access and then you can, you can come and say, I have an open access article and we pay you only for this because of the administrative burden. It would be very, yes, it would be very um, expensive probably to have people only uh, um, looking at, uh, and you, you should, then you, you'd have to add, submit a, pro, uh, uh, a request for an open access charge that we wanted to uh, uh, avoid and therefore it's in, introduced in, in the grant. Mm, I see. And my final question, uh, promised. Um, are you going to monitor uh, the open access uh, compliance uh, resulting from your open access policy in the future? Or are you doing that right now? How we do? Are you monitoring? Yes, uh, we, the we, we will monitoring it. So we maybe not uh, in a steady state, but we, we, we will make a, a study 2015 to look at the developments. Uh, in the first two years of, with this new policy, and then we will take the results of this study to decide on the future policy. So we could monitoring it, uh, of course, but it's also a, a question of resources. How much do you spend to monitor the activities of, of, of researchers? So it's, it's always a question of uh, administrative burden. Thank you. I have uh, a few comments um, in linked with the first questions. First of all, about the web pages. Um, I must say that most institutional repositories can generate automatically web pages, so it's not in opposition with an institutional repositories because you can generate personal profiles as we saw with InfoScience or or personal web pages with lists of publications. So I would say that uh, web pages can be a byproduct of institutional repositories. Um, secondly, about the decision of uh, the National Fund to uh, give a certain amount for uh, open access publication, I must say that um, working in a library, I try to promote this um, new um, support, but as it's not a, it is not a specific sum amount of money for publishing, most of the researchers told me that they never get 
the amount they ask for, so they are usually short of money, so I was very surprised to hear that most of the time they have money left. Uh, I heard exactly the opposite, that they never get the amount they ask for. So the first thing they will erase from the costs is the, pub the money for publishing in open access. So this is not really for me a, a, a decision which supports strongly open access. I mean, we can be based or, or presentation on this decision, but it's not really helpful for the time being because it will be the first uh, uh, budget which will be erased from the costs if they are short of money. Uh, the first point, thank you very much for the information. The second point, uh, I agree it's not the optimal solution yet. Um, if you have cuts in the budget, or, or the other way around, 80% of the budget are for, um, for uh, uh, salaries in, in a grant. And if you cut, often because you cut maybe one PhD position in a grant and so on, so it's quite clear which part of the budget uh, has been cut. Then the other 20%, yes, if we can uh, give a little bit more there, not only for open access, because you have other needs, where you sometimes you, you could have a little bit more freedom to use a little bit more uh, money beside salaries for your project. That would be our aim, and not specifically for, for open access. Open access, of course, the publications normally are at, uh, at the end of the, of the grant, and, and therefore you can a little bit plan, of course. If you see, oh, we have uh, two or three open access publications and some money left, then you can use it. And maybe one, once uh, you, you plan the conference and somebody else wa was ill and then you have the money already left for, for the next publication. But I agree it's not yet the optimal solution. Maybe I haven't understood the whole <laughs> concept of the open access because um, why do we need additional funds if we can put available all our research results at InfoSion's EPFL? So I, I'm, there's something that I, I'm new on this, that's why I came here. I don't fully understand. I know the valorization grants of SNF through a SCOPES project I directed and recently, well, soon we're going to, to complete that. And um, that valorization grant was actually very useful for go to conferences and present some research results, also to publish. But um, it's not a question just for you. Am, am I missing then the point? I mean, open access needs to be paid or can we get open access for free? So as, uh, as it has been shown, you have these uh, two roads, the gold road that, uh, that involves, well, ideally, a fully open access journal which has to cover its costs somehow, so usually by article processing fees, and the green road that's self-archiving. Okay, and uh, well, when you are lucky, you have either an institutional repository or a subject repository somewhere in the world that will accept your, your, your publications and host them normally at no, uh, let's see, at no transparent cost for you. There is still a cost, but it's usually paid by the institution or uh, whomever is uh, administrating the, the subject uh, repository. Uh, this is, of course, more interesting uh, from, a, from a simple economic point of view for the author. And, uh, well, obviously, being involved in an institutional repository, I can only say good things about this. But there is also a concern that 
perhaps these uh, these green open access documents, which are parallel usually to uh, let's say to uh, a normal uh, a normal article in a subscription journal, for example. So it's another copy, which is perhaps not exactly the same because uh, we are not usually not allowed to use in an institutional repository the final uh, publisher, uh, the final PDF produced by the publisher. The, the look and feel is copyrighted by them. So it's really the, the post print, so the, the post print is the best you can achieve in general. So the manuscript in the states in the state it's, it has reached after the peer review. So normally the content is the same, but it doesn't look as nice, really. Uh, that's enough to uh, sometimes for some people to be reluctant to use that road. And also, uh, it's perhaps not quite as visible as uh, the as an article or uh, any other kind of, uh, of publication that happened on the gold road because on the gold road you have your publication really at the official place where the where the, the article is distributed it's the the place where you can get the official reference that you can easily cite and it will be recognized and all that. Whereas the parallel copy on an institutional repository is perhaps a little bit less visible. And uh, well, that will of course depend on uh, how much work the administrators of the uh, repository put into uh, making the repository visible on uh, Google uh, and other search engines. Also, we will usually not be seen in, a, let's say, in a traditional uh, bibliographic database. Uh, if you search for papers by EPFL in the web of science, you will find many because we are a good research institution, but you will not see any trace of info science anywhere in that. So if, you, if you're looking for, for information through that, uh, through that medium, uh, you will never see that this publication can actually be read for free online because it's open access somewhere. It's in green open access. So there is... The, the, there are also a couple of drawbacks to the to the green uh, road, obviously, and uh, the funding agencies, when they show a preference for the gold road, uh, perhaps are that's what uh, motivates them to to this choice. I wouldn't know, but I'll be happy to to hear about that. May I add a comment as well? Um, the whole notion that you would get open access for free via repositories doesn't take into account the fact that the research system is paying um, for subscriptions. Um, that then, if you go to a subscription journal, mm -hmm. they impose an embargo, which might be six or 12 months, which imposes a delay on that access. You're still paying for the subscriptions. Now, it doesn't seem to you that you're paying, but your library's paying the funding the government's paying, and they're paying more than it would cost them were it to be open access. There's been several economic studies that show that open access, because it promotes uh, competition um, and uh, is a more effective uh, uh, market, drives the whole cost down. And so it's actually cheaper to pay APCs. What we don't want to do is to replace expensive, big deals for subscriptions with, with equivalent APCs. We've got to let that market uh, be open. The other hugely important point that uh, Ellen made is how 
what happens to that article when it's in a repository. If it's in a repository, it's deposited as a, as a Word document, perhaps before publication. It doesn't have all the markup. People can't reuse it. If it comes with embargoes, certainly in the life sciences, six or 12 months is too late. It, it's fine, it's free to read, but too late and you can't use it. So, the, 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 you, I mean, some repositories are different and they, and they host different types of services and there's no reason that they can't develop. But it'd be much better uh, uh, to put an article with that reuse uh, and immediately available as, as soon as it's published and put it in a repository as well. There's no reason you can't have it in a repository. So I, I think there's a lot of, of other factors about open access. The cost of publication or peer review has to be paid for somewhere, um, ultimately. Um, yeah, but, uh, you more or less already said most of what I was going to say. Um, from a practical point of view now, I mean, I completely agree that you really have to look at the complete economic system um, and uh, whether you're funding the subscription model or the, or the author pays model and the difficulties about the transition period and so on. But if we don't even want to make it so complicated, just to give you a simple answer to your very simple question, why don't we put just all the stuff into institutional repositories? If you are a researcher and you have a funder who imposes a mandate on you, which is, um, which, uh, which the publishers, um, uh, let's say, how can I put this in a politically correct way, um, <laughs> are happy about because they can impose restrictions that make it impossible for you to satisfy the funder's mandate without going for gold. Now I've expressed that in a very complicated sentence. Basically what I'm saying is if your funder says you cannot have an embargo period of more than six months and the publisher uh, and I'm talking now about basically the big legacy publishers. Um, they say, well, it's anything between 12 and 48 months, then you have no choice. You, you cannot, I mean, you can still put in institutional repository, but it will not, you will not be able to make it available at the terms imposed on you by your funder. Now, we are a funder ourselves. I'm not saying the funders are doing anything wrong. I'm saying the publishers are doing something that is maybe uh, driven by economic considerations rather than really making research accessible. Um, but I also wanted to say something about the question about um, uh, discoverability uh, of results in, in institutional repositories or in repositories more generally and the question whether um, the articles look nice and, and, and uh, whether they are just PDF documents or whatever. Um, there are, of course, huge differences, and one of the reasons why we as ERC encourage the use of uh, discipline-based repositories where it makes sense, where they, have a, a, um, um, where they are of significance and they are well-developed, in particular, for example, Europe PMC, is also because these repositories um, then hopefully also add, uh, 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 offer added value added services. So for example, all the um, uh, manuscripts submitted to Europe PMC are marked up to XML, so they become, um, I mean, they are probably at the end of the day, um, if you really want to do searches, text mining, and so on, it's probably of better value than what you get through a publisher's PDF. Uh, it somehow fits a little bit. Um, are there going to be more membership models for institutions that uh, give more discounts on open access publishing, for example, at, at PLOS or, or other uh, publishers? Um, we have had a, a membership scheme, and, and that was often um, to try and promote uh, a publication and open access. I mean, when PLOS started, there were no funder mandates. Funders didn't include APCs in the grants, and um, we did that. What we don't want, though, is to have those sorts of membership schemes, discounts, replacing big subscription deals. Uh, and I think what we're seeing now is the commercial publishers often taking that, and we, uh, even um, intermediaries like sort of the, the, the sort of EPSCONs who sell you the, the big subscription deals are now 
prepared to act as intermediaries for big APC deals. And what that will mean is that the price that you're getting for articles in different journals becomes less transparent. The whole price of the system becomes less transparent. The market becomes less competitive. So uh, certainly at PLOS and among the other pure open access publishers, we want more price transparency. Um, we don't encourage uh, big deals. And of course, memberships, uh, it's a nice way to support, uh, but, but they're part of a sort of legacy, legacy industry. Um, although, you know, I, I, think, I think we still have, have some, but we're, we're, you know, we're, we want price transparency and, and it to be completely upfront and open so that funders know exactly what they're paying for, where, and in which journal. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I might add um, some comments because uh, I think we see it exactly the same way, which, don't, which does not mean that, uh, for example, we at Copernicus, we have uh, what we call institutional agreements. So it's about the centralized payment of also fee by big institutions. We have, for example, an agreement with Max Planck Society, with the Helmholtz Association, uh, the Helmholtz Association as well as with uh, CNS Insu, um, that's a French um, um, funder for uh, oh, this part is for, for geosciences. And we do centralized payments so they don't have to reimburse. Um, they want to support open access, but they don't want to reimburse every single invoice. So we collect all invoices like in buckets and then we do centralized payment, which reduce the administrative administrative burden of these institutions, uh, make the whole process for the also much easier, much easier. Uh, but we also don't include any discount uh, in that prices also be, be because we think we um, already have quite low prices in comparison to some other publishers. And um, so because um, not having or saying that maybe memberships shouldn't replace um, these big deals, like uh, like just said, it's not about finding ways of facilitating an easier payment for institutions, which we, I think, all are really interested in. I'm just curious and wanted to ask Mr. Hochli, these 3,000 Swiss francs that SNF has decided to provide for these open access publications, um, does it have like a reason for, for coming to exactly that amount? What is the, 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 the decision based on? So we, we compared with other agencies what they, what they do and we, we, we would we said that we would take a limit where most of the publication should be funded entirely, but the highest one maybe not. So to not give an incentive for publishers or uh, to, to rise the, the charges for the, for a single article. So, but it's not uh, really a, a, a scientific formula how we find uh, this, this limit. Maybe I can uh, add something else, because I see a, a dilemma for, for many of us, for, for funders, for researchers, because uh, if you speak about cost, I agree fully that we should look at the cost of the system, of the publication system, not cost open access or, the, or other publications. And there, of course, you as researcher, you have the interest to publish in a high impact journal. And you don't look how, how uh, this, journal is run, how expensive are the, the subscription fees, etc. Because it's important that you have high impact uh, uh, publications. Funders, they, they want to have uh, on the publication list of research, if you submit a, a proposal, high impact uh, publications. And therefore, there is in your, you, don't, you don't look at the cost at the end. It's not your criteria how, how expensive is this journal compared to others, but is, is it a good journal? In the interest of the system would be 
that you, you publish in, in, in journals with low costs, of course. But then, then we have uh, really a different situation. So we cannot say you should publish in, real, in, in purely open access journals with low costs, no subscription fees, because then we, we should change the evaluation and say we look at open access publication, not, not at high impact publications. So, and there I see a tension in the system and that makes it very difficult to change the system because there are interests in all directions and to move in one direction is very, very difficult, I think. Just a short comment on the last comment. Um, I think here are quite a range of uh, open access publica, pu uh, publisher at the panel uh, publishing um, open access journals with quite high impact factors. So it's not the equation of uh, open access, low, low impact, it's just not valid. There are a lot of, um, of course, some of the new open access journals can't have an impact factor yet just because of, as you all know, the evaluation procedure at, at ISI, but there are really a range of uh, open access journals with really high impact factors, and if that's important, I think uh, open access have proven it that it's possible. I fully agree that the more we have high rank open access journal, the better. I fully agree with this. But as long as you have other journals with a high impact, of course, um, then researchers, should we urge them or should we let the freedom to them where they, they, they would like to publish. But I fully agree that uh, we should have very good open access journals to, uh, to change the system, it's important. Yeah, uh, uh, I mean, I, and again, I, I think, you know, as we talked earlier today, the whole research assessment basing the value of an article on where it's published rather than the intrinsic merits of the article itself is a real problem and has actually created much of the culture around uh, uh, around the sort of biases with the impact factor. Um, and I think we, we have to get away from that. Uh, um, um, you know, we want, we want good quality articles, we want good peer, rever peer review, we want quality assurance, and we want articles to be measured for their intrinsic worth, not where they're published. Um, just to add to Xenia and uh, to Katrina, but in my presentation, for example, I've been showing that. Um, so, so what we, you weren't here, but what we showed was um, a cloud of all the ISI, Web of Knowledge, Thomson Reuters index journals with um, impact factors, and we actually plotted those. Um, and by definition, those are the leading journals that um, ISI is um, indexing there. And we plotted, for example, our open access journals, and what we've been able to, to show is that they have above average impact factors. What I haven't shown in this presentation, but what we did as well plotted, was PLOS, BMC journals. All of these open access journals are actually performing above average. Um, so I think the stigma of open access journals being of, of low quality, or you know, like the recent attack by science magazine on open access journals is completely, uh, it's, it's, uh, there is no fundament to it. I mean, like there may be, you know, like some dodgy publisher somewhere in India or in Africa, but uh, it does not apply to the, to the big open access uh, publishers, which publish, by the way, the vast amount of the open access articles. Maybe some, one challenge we have, National Science Foundation, US National Science Foundation, they now, uh, if you submit the grant, they accept not only the publication list of peer review the journal, but also with other a contribution to the scientific debate, for example, blog posts with a, with a, a good uh, response from, from other scientists, and, and we don't do this yet, but that's a question. Can we uh, measure the scientific output in another way, where we, and this is all open access, of course, uh, uh, open blocks and so on, uh, can we change also the evaluation system towards this direction so that we look, do not only look at, at peer-reviewed journals, but also uh, at other uh, scientific uh, uh, important production which you produce open access 
in different ways. And uh, we have, it's, for us, it's a question if we should uh, do the same as the National Science Foundation. Um, I just joined a workshop in San Francisco organized by APLOS about article level metrics. Um, um, yeah, we are all here on the panel have different, from the publisher side, have different kinds of article level metrics in place which display the usage but also refer to discussion on social media. And very interestingly, um, one um, um, representative of the Wellcome Trust also attended the, um, the workshop and he showed um, a quite good example where um, a discussion in Twitter really showed them how, how um, valuable a certain research output was um, for a policy debate. Um, and not only, but also based on that, um, they think that they uh, will include um, yeah, those kind of measures into the, um, into the, the, the grant renewal because it's also like, especially these how is it discussed in social media, uh, can also add a really qualitative aspect to the quantitative um, yeah, evaluation and impact factors, I think, yeah. Thank you very much for all these question and answers. So um, <laughs> I will try to conclude briefly this day. Um, Um, my colleagues prepared uh, short conclusion, thanks to them. Um, perhaps you know that um, in Switzerland, uh, EPFL and worse, his, his, its library is known as very dyna dynamic, very dynamic, very, very dynamic. And depending on who is saying that, it's not always a, a compliment, some, sometimes a critic. So I hope that this... Um, um, that this conclusion will be politically correct and acceptable. Um, so, some remarks to conclude. Um, open does not mean free. I think we discussed just that. But that is not always clear to the researchers, to the authors. And I think uh, we have a lot, a long way to continue. <laughs> Um, today, there are many different models, not always transparent, to publish, even to publish in open access. So, for the researcher, more advocacy is needed to explain how this publisher uh, works and the other one, how it works. Um, there were questions about APC, what are fair APC, how are they calculated? It's still not very clear for all. Um, another remark, uh, which was quite, um, which was just said, open access and rigorous peer reviewing are fully compatible. It's a wrong idea to say that open access and low quality is, uh, is the same, on the same level. Research evaluation still strongly relies on impact factor is that a barrier for open access development? Are there other evaluation systems? We heard this morning that at the European Research Council, um, the project which are submitted uh, are not evaluated um, related to, relating to um, impact factors. So it's possible to look at research quality um, not through the the filter of impact factor. Open access not only concerns article distribution, but services, data, and work networking. The publisher work is widening. We have a lot of guidelines. Uh, it's not always simple for institutions and for researchers to uh, not get confused between all these guidelines. And, um, but we have not a lot of guidelines 
really binding, the researcher activity uh, publishing. So is there a need to establish mandatory policies? Um, we heard that the open peer reviewing, and I think uh, you will agree, has at least two benefits um, with um, implicating increased submission quality and more constructive peer reviewing process. Another question which is for us sometimes very difficult to, uh, to find an explanation to, open access initiatives are often launched by researchers, but still not fully understood by the research community. Why? I think we had some elements today. We are in, transition, in a transition period. We heard this a lot of times today. Where are we going and how long will it take and cost? These questions remain open. Thank you. So I will <laughs> conclude. Thank you to Caroline and uh, Julien. <laughs> um, I will really conclude this one this time um, with my most sincere thanks first to our institution, EPFL, which has supported our initiative throughout all stages, both from a political, logistical and financial point of view. All my thanks to the presidency, the dean of research and Mediacom. Thanks to our speakers who have given an enthusiastic response to our invitation. Some of them have made a long trip to take part in this conference. Really, thank you very much. And a big thanks to my colleagues at the library who have organized this conference. It was really uh, great, but heavy work. And in particular, in practic it's the end of the day. In particular, Aurore, Alexandra, Anne, Julien, Caroline, and Guylaine, thank you very, very much. And of course, thanks to the audience for your attendance, your interest, and your contribution in moving ahead the issues related to publishing in open access. That's the final word. Thank you.